thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with me today. I really appreciate it. No problem. No problem. Thanks for the inquiry. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you've, you've been keeping my attention on a regular basis. It was fun when I was thinking about who I wanted to talk to next. And I started looking at some of my favorite books and your name kept appearing, whether it was Crone, whether it was uh, Coffin Bound, whether it was Stray Dogs. Like I just started chuckling to myself like, hey, I, I might as well see how Brad Simpson's doing and if he's free because uh, he keeps popping up. Plus, I love the fact that you've worked with Justin Greenwood, who I was lucky enough to uh, sit down and do a recording with and, and get a chance to meet. So I, I kind of felt like there was maybe a connection there I should follow through on. Yeah, cool. I'm glad you mentioned Crone. I feel like that one went under the radar and uh, I love that book. I was a little disappointed when it didn't get, you know, more press. I was kind of, I kept waiting. I was like, you know, give it, give it time. There's maybe a slow, sometimes people take a minute to catch on. And I was really surprised it didn't get uh, the attention I think it deserves. I, I hope at some point it comes due because that was a beautiful book. I loved so much about it. I mean, the, oh, thanks. The, oh, my pleasure, man. The premise was, was lovely. And then as I started getting deeper into the book, I just loved the story that was, that was you know, so easy to sort of flip through the pages of her life and sort of just see all these great moments and tragic moments as well. But I thought it was really well done. I, uh, I hope you guys get to come back to that character again in the future. I don't know how or why or what the thing might be, but, you know, you yeah. guys were a magic team. That was a lot of fun to enjoy. <laughs> I would love to uh, circle back. And I mean, working with Justin and Dennis, that's fun because it's just, it's just friends, you know, and you oh, that's craft cool. this idea and and th those are the funnest books for me, you know, and it's, it just has a, it has a low key feel. I mean, everybody's motivated, everybody's passionate about the story, but it's just, it's just casual, you know, with your buddies and you can bounce ideas off each other. And uh, I think it makes for good work. I'm curious now because you've, you've introduced it, you know, I, I love the idea of working with friends. I'm actually doing a, a fun little uh, collaborative effort with some friends right now. And I'm thinking, you know, about all the fun talk that comes out of it. Like, oh, what could this be? And, you know, what's it going to be like? I, I'm curious what your relationship was to Justin and Dennis before working on that book together. How had, had you met both of them and, and what sort of had been your relationship uh, before Crone start? It usually... I guess it usually starts with mutual friends, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's probably how I met both those guys. Oh, wow. uh, okay. And then, you know, I think uh, Justin, the first time we worked together was uh, we met and then a few days later, he had something like a short notice cover he had to get colored. Mm. And uh, I just hopped on it, you know, I was available and then, you know, the chemistry was really good, you know, like it's just it's just like that sometimes, like that your approach is really rhythmic with the way someone draws. So uh, yeah, and then on top of that, Justin's like the nicest person in comic books by far. Like he's just, he's an easy going dude. It's like impossible not to get along with them. So from then we went on, uh, it did some other things. And then uh, I, he did a book at Image called Siege and then the uh, the colorist couldn't continue in the second volume, so I hopped on, and you know from then we've done a, a few things, and it's always been a blast. But Crone uh, is my favorite; like that was just the best focused effort I think of our work, and uh, I, I I just like everything about I, I like uh, the consistency of the color treatments. You know, usually when you look back on books, you know you have some cringe moments where you're under the gun, and you're like, oh, but everything Crone feels nice and. Uh, and cohesive to me, especially the covers I, I like very much. So there's always this great idea when you're going to talk with someone and you, you know it's gonna be a bit of an interview, it's gonna be a conversation, you have some points you wanna address. And then there'll be that moment where the person you're speaking with suddenly just like walks their way into one of your questions. And I, I really love how you did that for me so perfectly with the idea of describing how what you felt was a real great consistency with the color treatment in uh, Crone. And the first thing that I know that's gonna come to a lot of people's minds is, what does he mean? If I'm not a colorist, what does that mean? So I'd love to hear what a colorist does. Like people understand artists, but they, they sort of think it covers all things. And I think with comics, 
there's parts that people don't always remember. It's like, hey, you know, someone put those letters in there. They're called a letter. And they do an amazing job of bringing voices to life. Well, someone brought the vibrant colors to a comic. And can you tell me a little bit, just, you know, sort of introduced as far as what you think about color and what a colorist does and what you're talking about with color treatment? Well, I, I think, um, well, I think uh, the color in Crone in particular is really rhythmic, like the saturation kind of matches throughout the, um, the, uh, flashback scenes seem to work really well, which we kind of played with that idea of the flashbacks rather being uh, desaturated or muted, we made them uh, very bold and pulp, like almost like an old school, you know, uh, Conan cover or something of that sort of description. So um, I, I guess that's one thing I really look for well, what I aim to do in coloring is to create a really rhythmic look, you know, like a consistency from page to page. And then with uh, an artist like Justin or uh, Danny on Coffin Bound, someone who lays in a lot of black, I find that saturation and bold really lends itself to that. And it opens a lot of opportunities to create moods and, um, and creates and also hit little story beats, you know, when maybe something sad happens or something violent, you know, maybe if there's a, a sad moment of introspection, you just have a blue wash or maybe, you know, when in a particularly gory or violent moment, everything's cast in red. So those, those are the things that really interest me in color. Yeah, it's, it's something I only became aware of. Um, I can honestly say it was through, um, a girl I was dating and she introduced me to the movie Billy Elliot and mm -hmm. I, I remember she started pointing out these color moments throughout the movie and I kind of looked at her like what did you just open my third eye I, I have no idea how you did that but you you know illuminated something that I simply never considered before in that way or hadn't seen how uh, significantly it can play into storytelling so it, it blew me away from those moments to then look back at comics at any other medium that I was enjoying and what those elements could bring, how important they could be, the ideas you were describing about what we might think to be a traditional flashback. Does it go sepia? Does it go, you know, muted? Does it have a faded look? Do you get those lens flare and uh, other little sort of markers that, that, that tell you that something has dating to it and has light wear and exposure? Or do you give it a vibrancy that makes it feel more fresh than the current time? So I love that idea that you're describing there. And I also liked what you were describing about the differences when working with, uh, you know, Justin or Danny, you know, there can be elements that are gonna come into play that you need to consider. Like if there's a lot of black, um, if there's a lot of dark colors, how can you relay that in something that doesn't feel like it's just, I don't know, uh, <laughs> as you said, muting, but also sort of just, minimizing other things because it's so oppressive. Like it can just be like this heavy shadow and depending on how thick it is or how dense, it can really take up yeah. a lot of space, bring a lot of weight. But then if you play with that context, you can actually do more than just one thing with it. Um, uh, and that's with, a really great, yeah. With those, uh, and a, a real opposite example would be someone uh, like Pitor Kowalski, who I colored for Bloodborne and, uh, well, we've done like a million books together, <laughs> right. but. Uh, he, uh, you know, his work is so detail oriented. You have to be really careful. You want, you don't want to obscure his work. He's put in all this meticulous line, you know, and if I were to have a loose color treatment, you know, like painterly on top, it would obscure his work. So with him, you know, it's, it's a much more delicate approach. Uh, Jenna on Black Stars Above, the very delicate, fine pen work, you know, I felt like really muted and and just show that beautiful work, you know, know when to step back a little bit. I love that idea. And I'm also curious, you know, how do you fine tune a relationship when you're working with someone for the first couple projects, the first couple of pages, um, maybe even um, trying to just establish like what a tone is that you both want to agree on before you even attempt said pages. Uh, is there a way that you like to introduce um, yourself and what you're thinking or seeing when you are invited onto a project or are meeting with someone and looking at their art. Um, how do you approach those ideas with 
someone else. You know, it's, it's such a conversation. It's such a bit of a compromise. It's, it's got so many different layers to it. And it's about a relationship, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and you know, the, the writer will come to you with some ideas and the artist, and you always want to be very respectful of that. And uh, I usually just tell them the same thing. Hey, I, I don't necessarily articulate myself via email. Let me take a pass at it. Let me screw up a page and then we'll go from there, you know, uh, we'll take a look and revise and, and I'll get your thoughts. And uh, I, it's always going to go to that anyway. Like you're always going to need a pass to, to kind of analyze what's working and what's not. But uh, for the most part, you know, a brief conversation can give you a really good idea, you know, like black stars above, it's very uh, cold, muted, weathered, you know, it's just that one was easy to dial into. And uh, on, on a rare occasion, despite the fact that everybody is, is very nice that I've worked with in comics, is the chemistry is just not good. And you, <laughs> you know, those are the books that <laughs> just aren't the best, you know, and, and it, you, you never realize it at the time, but in retrospect, you go back and look, you know, man, probably wasn't the best decisions on my point, the part, you know, the chemistry wasn't there, or you'll see another colorist on that person's art and you can concede, oh, it looks a lot better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can, I, I can definitely remember different times in my life where, you know, depending on who you're working with on something, you're thinking to yourself, like, look, this clearly shows that we just wanted to get this thing done. And <laughs> sometimes that's, that's all we did. You know, we got it done and we're glad we got it done. But man, it, it would be different if we had enjoyed that or if there had been greater opportunity for us to, to connect in whatever ways. I love that you brought up um, Black Stars Above. Um, that book. So I was reading, just looking up some different fun stuff. And I came across this uh, Harry Casson who wrote something that I found that was just so lovely. And it was his compliment that what you do with color is bleak and that there's a beauty in the bleakness that you discover and you uh, set it up for people and gave examples from Coffin Bound, um, gave examples from Black Stars Above. And I, I really sort of enjoyed that description because I've loved both of those books. I, I really, I mean, Black Stars Above, you caught me with the first cover. I'm looking, I'm walking through the shop. I'd seen some teaser promo for it. And when I saw it, no, picked it up and flipped it through, I was just like, this is gorgeous. This is absolutely gorgeous. It, it finds that way of walking through a very dark terrain, but it keeps it from being something that's just a one plotting note. I'm always reminded of that teaser for Eyes Wide Shut, and it was just the piano key over and over. <laughs> and I feel like sometimes you can really come across that where someone's so intent on making sure you understand how dark this is that they eliminate everything else. And you're just kind of like, right. that, that's not necessary. Why is this happening? <laughs> yeah, they uh, they brought some great ideas. Um, I mean, L Lonnie had some great ideas too about hitting those beats. Like when it is when you when uh, there's that real desolate snowy scene, and then you just have that red tree, you know, and just some cool moments like that. Yeah, not only that, but I felt like there was this wonderful beauty just in moments where you would see that there was uh, the character sort of like seeing the shadows in the woods or things like that. And it wasn't like it was like, oh, there's trees and there's just ink blackness around them. There were these lovely layers to it as well. And, and I also felt that that just worked so well with all the other elements involved. I mean, it's a really gorgeous story. It, it, it's doing a lot of fun things. And I felt your art just captured that. And when I was reading this description, I was like, I got to bring this up because it is such an interesting way to say, look, I'm going to give a compliment that I, maybe I need to explain. It's this idea of bleakness and about, you know, sadness or um, other things that come to mind when you think of bleak and how you can convey all of those layers of a spectrum through your, your color. I, I'm curious, what, what brought you to color? Why? Why color? Why colorist? Uh, is there, was there a significant moment? Was there a shining sort of like, that's it, color? Well, um, my, my degree in college is painting. So I'm, uh, my background's in traditional painting, although I haven't painted in a long time. But uh, I used to do just 
almost like very old style paintings with glazing and uh, almost stuff that has a sense of antiquity to it. And uh, in college, one of my best friends was Nick Tregada. And uh, so in, in adult life, I really, I was living in uh, this small town in North Carolina and I was teaching at an art center and stuff. And I just, it was fine and all, but I just really, I wanted to get, do a career in art of some type because I thought it would be a catalyst, you know, to really motivate me and get better. And I just thought it would be interesting. So uh, I, I moved out to California, to San Francisco, and I started taking some classes at Academy. And by uh, coincidence, Nick Tregata moved out uh, at the same time. So we re reconnected and uh, we started talking and he was working pretty steadily in comics at the time. And he thought, uh, you, know, you, you know, you should try coloring. You know, I think you'd have a good aptitude for it. So uh, I guess at like age 33, Nick started teaching me how to use a computer and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a mouse. You want it to get <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was literally like, uh, like, how do you turn it on? It's on standby, just touch it. You know, it's, it was that bad. So uh, yeah, I, I started learning and then, um, and then I got really lucky and then I, I got to color Nick on a few things at Marvel and that's how I started. And then uh, some of that stuff, whoo, it's pretty, pretty rough to look back on, but, <laughs> but then uh, I, I got to do this great book called Vengeance with uh, Nick and Joe Casey writing it. And uh, I really started to figure it out. I started to figure out the moods and it was, it's an insanely weird book. So then I, I started to really, have this opportunity to experiment with the color treatments and stuff. And that's kind of was my breakthrough book, right? Where I, I really was like, I want to do this and I think I have an aptitude for it. So, yeah. That's a great story. I mean, I, I love the synergy there of the idea you're like, yeah, so I go out to San Francisco and he comes out too. And it turns out, you know, he's able to take what you're doing with art and show you this possibility with uh, color. I'm, I'm curious if it would be okay to rewind even further though and, and go back to what brought you into painting? What brought you uh, into that medium? Was it a transition from another medium? Did your art start somewhere else or was it always the, the paint and the brush? Yeah, I think that um, just in high school, you know, I was just obsessed with art and we had a, uh, an art room at school and every moment that I had, I, I was in there. Uh, you know, and, and started in high school experimenting with oil paints and stuff. And um, yeah, I've just always, uh, you know, I, I grew up on comic books, but I've always loved fine art and, you know, artists like Lee Bonacue and, you know, abstract art and everything from that to, I, I love the American expansionist phase painters like Thomas Moran and uh, Frederick Church. I just, I have a thing for big, grandiose art and impactful art. So that's that's really what um, what got me so interested. And then I went to the Savannah College of Art and Design and finally could do art all the time. And those were probably my, my most unfocused years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> You know, where I drank with my friends all the time and went out and uh, and then after college, you know, I really dived back in. I, and I started painting just uh, all the time. So it, it was a, it's I've always just been on a very weird winding road. <laughs> yeah, that sometimes leads to the best destinations, right? I mean, it's always it's always sort of fun to go. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't maybe a straight path, but look what I got to do along the way. Um, that's a that's a good point too because for a while I used to be like kind of down on myself like those college years you really overdid it Brad but uh <laughs> now when I look being an old guy with kids and stuff when I look back on the experiences I think some of the experiences really influence like color and like when you look at a scene you know when you look at a bar or something and you've you've been in that place before like you can really convey uh, dig back on your experiences to convey that. So uh, I've kind of come around full circle to appreciate some of the the time I quote unquote wasted. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, it's it's a challenge sometimes when you're like, wow, I wonder if there's something else I should have been doing with that time. Or, you know, you, you see that person who at different points, I distinctly remember I was still pursuing a quickly falling away sports career. And I'm 19 trying out thinking I can maybe do like a community college to a college sort of transition thing. And it's around that time that um, a young soccer player came up and he was 19 and a professional and signing his contract. And we're all talking about it. And there was a guy on the team as well, who was maybe like 22 and he had had an interesting road to, to get to school. And I remember I said, man, I'm 19, I'm here. He's 19. And I, I have to look back on my life and wonder where are the moments that he went left and I should have gone left instead of going right. You know, how, how, you know, how do you, you do that comparison thing? And it can be a very difficult challenge where you're, you, you're measuring your accomplishments at a certain age in life, not taking into account everything that comes along with it. Um, yeah. It, well, <laughs> and I tell you too, when you, the older you get, you realize it's a, uh, it's always going to be a series of ups and downs, you know, because you just, you, uh, especially being a freelancer, you just deal with hard things, you know, and, and there are times you're flying high and you're on great projects. And there's other times, no matter how far into your career you get, it's going to be drudgery. It's writing invoices, it's chasing money down, it's, uh, you know, trying to finish, like trying to finish a book sometimes is just a real drawn out <laughs> process, you know, and uh, or you've been in communication trying to line something up for a long time, or you're putting pitches out there to companies and they're getting rejected. Like, I don't think you ever reach some plateau where you don't just get completely kicked in the ball sometime. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> I do freelance writing. I've been lucky enough to do some comic script projects in the past couple of years. And there's that moment where I've got one or two things going and it's like, okay, how can I build on this? And it just takes one alteration, one thing to fall through, or I, I'm thinking that I've got two or three things that are rolling together. And suddenly I'm down to maybe one and I'm holding on to that one, like, okay, man, <laughs> it's you and me. We, we not only have to cross the finish line, but I need enough out of you to get me something to make up for those other two while I'm looking for other work. And I feel like that's such a juggling act. It's like you are aware of these deadlines you're setting up for yourself. But at the same time, if that's not going to be enough money, you're still trying to pull in another project while completing deadlines, while, you know, you're, you're never doing one thing. <laughs> oh, that, that's absolutely true. And, uh, you know, it, it, it can come off like you've, you've mismanaged your workload to someone if you become extremely overbooked or busy. But there is, it is Murphy's Law. Like you are, it is feast or famine. There are going to be times where you're just starving. And then when the work's good, you got to hop on everything you can. <laughs> and it's going to shave some years off your life. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've had a couple of the, I'm, in the last month, I remember I had a, a project start up that I knew was coming. And then suddenly I got a request. And then I had two other deadlines I was fishing. And I was like, hey, hon, so I'm about to get really cute for the next week or two. And I just, I don't know how else to describe it, but thank you for understanding whatever you're about to witness. And I'm sorry in advance, but, you know, I, I wanted this, you know, and it's almost like I can hear that voice in my head, like, yeah, you wanted this, right? Didn't you yes. ask for all this stuff to happen? Well, it's happening. Be ready. And, there, and there's someone who's dying to do it too, you know? So it's like, you never, um, you never want to bemoan the fact that you have too much work. But I mean, my approach now with it is I, uh, I just try to milk every moment out of the day and then I go to bed. I turn off all my devices. I don't watch anything. I go to bed at nine. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, my, that's my strategy. And then I get jacked on coffee the next day. I say, my brain's going to work for the next nine hours. And then after that, you know, there's not much more I can do. So I, I don't try to do that drudgery anymore where I just stay up all night and stare into the screen when your productivity exponentially goes down every hour. I've, I've got a process. It's in refinement. It, it sometimes goes the way I want. And then there are other times where 
I, I've been fully aware of the fact that I'm like, yeah, I know what I could, you know, potentially do, but I could also power through in the next three to four hours and kind of check something off. And it's interesting how those moments you're like, do I have it? Yeah, I've got it. All right, we're going to get this thing done. And then I can say that's done. And tomorrow I can just work on this and this instead of <laughs> three or four things. Um, I, I love what you were describing though about how you've learned this now. You know, you've kind of gotten to a place where you've, you've done it one way. And after doing it, you said, hey, I either don't want to do that or I'm going to modify it or instead I'm going to do this. Um, are there other fun things you've, you've learned about yourself, your process, when you're working on comics that, that has become something like, this is what I do now. I've, I've tried it a few different ways, but I know as a colorist, when I'm working on a project, um, I either have you know, an intent or a message or a, an approach. And as you mentioned, you usually you know, internalize what's being given to you by the writer and the artist. You then try and take that pass at it. But when you're taking that pass at it, is there a, a checklist you developed that in your mind that's like, look, when I'm doing a project, I want to keep all of these things sort of on the horizon or, you know, be mentally checking things off or something along those lines. I think one of the things that I've changed that really helps me is uh, I try to take pages up to about 80 or 90 percent completion and then I move on. And uh, I find if I take a break, it's easy to finish something. Like sometimes just finishing something, you can toil on it, you know, for an extra hour or two. You really got to maximize your hours, you know, during the day. So uh, there are times when you can't do that, where you have something short notice, where someone needs a solid and you have to do it quick. But even a cover image, man, I find if you work it up to about 90% completion and then look at it with fresh eyes the next day, you will absolutely improve it. You will, and, and not only that, you might get an idea that completely just takes it to another level. So uh, a lot of colors say I color three pages a day, I color five pages a day. I never really try to look at it like that. I try to get a group of pages in progress that are rhythmic with one another. And then I take a break before I finish, you know, it's like I, um, so I think that's the, probably the, the main thing I've figured out about me and what, what works best for me. I like that idea. I think it's, I think it's always, I love hearing process. I feel like for anyone else who, who's listening, that could be an insight they never considered. I distinctly remember the first time a teacher in a writing class said, yeah, and then there's so-and-so who writes the end of their stories and then writes to the ending. And I was like, I, I'm, what? I'm, I'm sorry. Did you just, can you do that? You can do that? And then, you know, you, as you gradually go through this discovery of like, hey, man, it's, it's your story. You can do just about anything. Whether you pull it off, that's an entirely different matter completely. But this idea of how you can approach something, not just with the beginning, but instead write that ending and then work towards it. Um, <laughs> and having that option, I can honestly say I, I was slaving over a novel for a good 10 years. I just couldn't get it to where, and then I was like, I'm going to try it. I'm going to write the ending. And I did. And I was like, oh, I can get there. And I yeah. ended up, you know, getting to that point, finishing it, knowing I just put it in a drawer and I'll either pitch it or I've been pitching it and doing that fun stuff with it. But that knowledge that I found a way to get to the end, that I found that way to get to a completion. Your approach is really interesting to consider with this idea of I'm going to get it to 90% and then I'm going to come at it with fresh eyes, which for my revision process is always like the next day, I'm always looking at it going, all right, I get this, but what was I doing here? And am I yeah. sure I still want to do, you know, it can really just give you that. Maybe it's the caffeine because <laughs> I'm yeah. usually three cups in by like, you know, 945. Um, Caffeine's magical. I mean, it's, I don't see how anybody could function without it. I mean, just how alert. Well, I mean, when you look at a computer screen too, like your, your brain is getting acclimated. So if I'm coloring something and it's just a little bit dark, you know, my, my vision is so calibrated from staring at that screen for eight hours and, and you take that break and you come back, I'm like, oh man, I, gosh, this is like 5% too dark. This will print a little dark. And you, you just hit some levels and everything looks so much better. So there's definitely like the eye fatigue. There's the physiology of fatigue as well. 
and then I, I think I've written on it, I've written about it on Twitter before, but you know, uh, when you're working with a traditional color page, sometimes if you're doing color holds, which is when you take a color and trace the uh, black line art in places, that's incredibly tedious. So that's the work you wanna do at the end of the day when your brain's mush. That's when you put the kids to bed, you just pour a glass of whiskey, you sit at your screen, you're like, all right, and you just do the drudgery. Like you're just digging a ditch when you're doing stuff like that. So yeah, there, there's all kinds of creative ways to, to, to pair the different things where you, you need different mentalities. <laughs> no, I, I completely agree. I, I, I remember another writing instructor and, and noticing that it would come across where they're like, hey, do certain things depending on how you're feeling. You know, if you're feeling fresh and creative, write some new stuff for a while or really dig into something that you've been, you know, but when you're tired and drudgery, think low maintenance. Think of something that doesn't require a lot of higher thinking, but that you know it just requires a certain amount of drudgery. And there's simply no better way to say you're just going to get through that thing. <laughs> yeah. And and that's your only intention. I'm, I'm curious, you, you come into comics, you've been working with art, you went to Academy of Art, uh, or sorry, you were going to art school. Was it Academy of Art in San Francisco? Uh, yeah, I took some uh, some gr uh, graduate classes there to learn how to use a computer. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Um, and then you're introduced through Nick to start working on uh, a couple of projects from Marvel. Did you, I'm curious for the most part, because you had already been interested in comics when you were younger and you'd had an interest. Did you come across some early surprises when you were working in, like you, you might have had an idea of how things were done or might have sort of had an impression and then you start working on it and you're like, oh, we, we do that? This is how we do this. You know, and it can be sort of just an insight into there's what you think goes on and then there's what actually happens. I, I can tell you, um, well, it, it was definitely a learning process like, uh, learning the protocol to put a page through to make it ready for print. Uh, that's, that's extremely difficult to me. I, and so much so, and I don't even, I think printing's gotten so much better, you don't have to do it anymore. But uh, it was so difficult for me, I had to get my wife to help me write an action on my computer that would back up my blacks with this layer of blue so I could take things to print. So there are certain things that were intimidating. Uh, and then it, I was just extremely nervous about something not printing well, like something printing dark and learning about K-tone and how much black is in your color. Uh, because especially kind of working for Marvel right out of the gate, I would just, I'd be nervous, like writing an email. And <laughs> I, I, would, I would be so nervous, like, sending something off to print because I was thinking at the time, if this prints dark, you know, I'm done, you know, I'm never going to work again. And it's just, yeah. It, and uh, I was just way too high strung, you know? So I, and when I look back on it, I could have just remedied that so easy by getting one of my buddies who's a colorist to look at it and say, does this look all right with the K tone? Is it, but you're just in this, uh, in this zone where you, uh, I don't know. And then you, you do have misadventures as well. Like one time uh, my editor asked me to do a really quick fill in on Thunderbolts. And so he's like, it's gonna be two pages and it, it has to be done at eight in the morning. I'm like, great, but only, <laughs> only one page is ready. I was like, all right, so I, I color the one page and it's uh it's Kev Walker, which I mean I, I'm a big Kev Walker fan. And I was like, whoa, yeah, this is man, this is killer. And uh oh. I, so um I color it and it looks all, you know, looking back, it looks all right. So then uh I I I like, all right, I'm gonna wait for this next page. And uh, you know, I wait for a while and I wait, and then it's like gets to be midnight and there's uh no page. So <laughs> I keep, uh, I keep kind of going to bed and then getting up and checking my machine, you know, to see if the page has come. So, 
When did it finally come through? Right past 4.30 in the morning, I get the page. (laughs) And I'm like, all right. And this is early in your career when you're not very fast. I mean, I can color a page in two hours now if I have to, but I was was not very fast. So I, I just am cranking on this page. I color it. And then uh, I get a buddy to look at it. And uh, he's like, man, this thing is a raw scan. It's not prepped for print or anything. And uh, so basically <laughs> when, it, when it was time to turn in the page, I realized that my, my work was not even usable. So I had a total nervous breakdown. And I I finally, I figured out how to kind of paste my work into the page that is formatted correctly and all these things. And when it was all said and done, the book went to print and it all got turned in and it it came out decent considering my level of experience. But yeah, those are, those are the experiences you have early in your career. They're just comical. Right. Now, I have to ask, because this is how it would probably happen for me. Did you have another project you need to do starting at like eight or nine that morning for another <laughs> deadline that was actually because that's usually like I'm sweat soaked from something like that. And I'm like, OK, so now I'm going to go to bed for about two hours. Hopefully, I don't know, some kind of fever nightmare. And then I'll get up and I have work to do because, <laughs> you know, that's just how it is. If it's if, like you said, feast or famine. So if, if those moments are going to occur for me, there's usually some other thing that I'm like, yeah, I wanted to be fresh for that. And now I'm just totally drained, but I still have work to do. And I don't want to, you know, <laughs> be ungrateful that I have work to do. No, well, I, I've been in that situation before, but in that particular situation, it's more just like crickets. It's like, okay, did I do a good job? <laughs> you got anything else for me? <laughs> and then like, you know, six months later, you hear from somebody, hey, can you fill in a few pages on this? <laughs> Yes, please. You still like me. <laughs> I have not been blacklisted or persona non grata. Or... Yes. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, that's the, um, especially in those days when you're starting off too, you got to realize that you have to build a lot of connections to be steady with work. And uh, you're just, you, you have a few co- connections and you clean on to them very tightly, you know, like I just hope that, and for me, it was a, uh, for a long time in my mind, you know, Marvel was it, you know, I just, I got to get in with Marvel and that's going to be my career. But I turned out being a totally indie guy, you know, and my career ended up pretty much being at image and companies like that. So you can't, yeah, you can't let your perception shape or your, your preconceived ideas, like shape what your career is going to be. I really appreciate you bringing up the fears, man. I, I can imagine anyone else who's listening is feeling the same way. I know this is, I mean, the few connections that I have in comics, I'm so grateful for that it almost feels like it, it's, it's so uh, tenuous. It's, it's so, you know, you, you wonder to yourself, like, is this like a, a line from a spider web? Like, it, does the wrong vibration ruin everything? Am I, you know, I'm, I'm constantly walking a tightrope. And as you pointed out early in your career, it, you're just trying to, you know, be recognized for the quality that you're bringing to keep uh, getting work because you're producing the quality they need. You know, you're looking for any kind of consistency, any kind of feedback that says, hey, I'm, I'm doing well because when it's just crickets, unfortunately, it's just crickets in your own mind, which is a yeah. very dangerous thing if you have a creative mind because you can go creatively down some dark places like they hated it. They called everybody. Everybody knows I'm terrible. I'm never going to work again. You know, and it can yeah. really turn into, you know, I'm curious how you recovered from that morning after having kind of that nervous breakdown with the page. Like, uh, what was the next day like for you? As you said, crickets, like, did you, were you able to work on something else? Did you try and read and write? Was it just under the covers? Uh, <laughs> well, it, it's, uh, that, uh, that's a really good thing to bring up. I think what you're talking about, how you manifest these situations in your mind when the reality is that editor is probably, he's, got a book that's super late. He's getting people to fill in. He's trying to get it to print. He probably had the most stressful (laughs) week, you know, so, and he's not giving you another thought. I mean, and that, (laughs) that, those pages could print like shit and he would not even give it any thought because at that point they're in like emergency mode. Like, and you understand, you come to that realization now, but, um, 
you know, the thing about being a freelancer is when you look back on it in retrospective, it is really hard to get started, you know, and maybe if you knew how hard it was, you wouldn't have been so gung, gung ho to do it. But I think it really comes down, you need about 30 people, you need about 30 artists, writers, editors that you've just done solid work for, that you've built a rapport. And sometimes you do good work for people and you're just, you're not gonna do anything else with them. And sometimes you're just gonna make a lifelong connection and you're gonna do a lot with them. So um, it, it's all about relationships, you know? And it's like where, where you really earn your stripes as a freelancer is when you uh, get stuff done on time, you know, when things go bad and when stuff, you know, looks really good. And, uh, and I think being nice too, and I, I don't mean like you have to be fake, but you know, when things are bad, if you can still be pleasant. And I mean, I, I've said it to Justin before when we are under the gun on a book or someone else, I said it. Uh, you know, no matter how bad the deadline is, I say it beats the days when there are no work, you know, that <laughs> right. beats those days. <laughs> nothing, yeah, nothing more difficult to, to deal with than like, I've got all this free time and, you know, I'd really rather be doing something, anything. <laughs> Hi, universe. I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and, and I, I guess that's the main thing when it, when it's real, when it is bad, you just gotta, you gotta laugh. You gotta have a sense of humor about it. But I, uh, you know, I understand uh, the, the, you know, as a freelancer, what it's like when you, you know, you're not getting anything and you got to go out there and make your own opportunities. I really understand that stress and, you know, even with like a year like I had last year where I did uh, Stray Dogs and I've probably never done a book that sold so much. Once you come off the buzz of that, then you have the next year and you say, well, I should probably start lining some work up. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's not like I'm going to uh, draw a new copy for, you know, extra copies <laughs> or color extra copies of that. You know, I, I'm not involved in every new edition or, you know, second printing or something that that's all happening after me, you know, I, yep. I need to do the next thing that I get paid for, you know, work. Um, <laughs> I can imagine um, that there's been also there, there's some surprises you uncover when you first start working in comics, but you, you also mentioned something that I imagine would include surprises that you have uh, encountered along the way, such as initially thinking like Marvel, that's, that's the ticket. Mm -hmm. Now looking back going, okay, so actually that wasn't the ticket. My ticket ended up being a lot of different things. Were there any other surprises you encountered in the industry as you were working through it where you either saw trends going or um, even with your own work moving into, you know, away from the Marvel brand and working with other brands? Were there any other sort of like significant moments where you're like, I did not expect that. That, that was not what I was expecting. Hmm. Well, I mean, you're always surprised by just certain relationships like uh, coloring coffin bound. Like I, uh, I was just surprised how fluid that work relationship with Danny was. And, uh, you know, we just, we, I do a lot of covers for her and stuff still. And there's just a really good rapport there. There's a very uh, rhythmic working process where when I get her art, I feel very comfortable and I just, I don't know. I, I just feel like I could kill, col color a million issues of her work and, and, uh, and it would be exciting and, um, and engaging. So that you're always surprised by, and, and, you know, a relationship like that too is, you know, she's in Greece, you know, or, or working with someone like Fitor after all these years who uh, I just laid eyes on this year in a Zoom call. So you never, uh, and I mean, and uh, me and Pitor, like we both can, uh, I think we can both be grumpy old dudes on the uh, on deadline as well, but our, somehow our uh, working relationship has really <laughs> stood the test of time and, uh, and, and there's been some good work to show for it too, so. 
I would imagine. Um, I mean, what we've already seen so far. It, do you ever, I'm curious, while you're working on someone, with someone on something, have you encountered the process where you thought to yourself, hey, I've got an idea. I don't know when we can do this later, but I'm going to make a note to myself and either one or both of the people or maybe the entire team I'm working with. I see something that we could do that that's completely outside of what we're working on. It's either an idea or a spark or um, a similar moment like that where you're like, hey, there's an energy here. I wonder how it would work with this. And is that, do you have a list, you know, so that, you know, at some point you're like, hey, I've got a hole in my schedule and I know they do too. When that happens, this is something I would love to pitch for us to do. I've definitely uh, solicited friends uh, if we're working on something at a one company or maybe saying, you know, we could, you know, let's do a pitch sometimes. Let's do a pitch for image comics or, or take a pitch somewhere. And, uh, I'm always working on pitches with, with people like that's, uh, that's probably something that, uh, that people don't realize is you put a lot of ideas out there. And you can't have too much, you can't be too precious about an idea, even if it comes out beautiful. You know, you just have to realize that most of them aren't going to get picked up, or maybe half of them will, will get picked up. So, uh, yeah, I would say I, 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 I do that quite a bit. And uh, uh, Pitor and I did a short story for uh, Razor Blades magazine, and then the writer really liked it. And uh, now we're going to turn that into a series at Dark Horse. So, oh wow, that's great! Yeah, Razor Blades is a fun one. Um, <laughs> a lot of good, a lot of good stuff coming out of there. I, I'm I'm curious now because I was I was thinking about this idea. Of, there are certain things you can kind of count on when it comes to freelancing. You know that the examples we've talked about so far. You know, if you've been putting a lot of projects out there and nothing's been hitting for a while, if you're going to get any of them, you'll probably get all of them. They'll probably all come at once. They'll all be doing <laughs> yeah, the same day. Exactly. Right? These, these are things you've, you've learned to kind of count on. I'm, I'm also curious if in comics, there are some things you can kind of count on that are similar to that feeling. It's like, well, you can always kind of count on maybe, you know, the first 10 pages coming in uh, pretty early. The second 10 coming in a little bit later and the last 10 coming in about six hours before, or something like that, where there's there's these things where you can always kind of count on certain things are likely to happen. Um, you've had one or two experiences where you think to yourself, hey, I, I think I can kind of see that coming next time. Or, are there ever any things like that that are, are similar to what we were describing with freelancing, but you've seen uh, them in your I, experience with comics? <laughs> I can tell you this 100%. When you do a, a book these days uh, for a publisher, Image Comics, 90% of publishers, they want three issues in the can before you go to print. And I guarantee you, after you finish those three pages, no matter how far ahead you are or how good you're doing, you will run out of lead time by the end and be on death <laughs> It has never happened. I've never finished. I, I've never finished a project like a month before and said, "Woo, glad to that that's done." <laughs> <laughs> okay, I could definitely see where you're like. I can always count on this. <laughs> I'm going to be working right up to the dip. <laughs> it's just the process, and I mean, I'm glad that companies do that, where you have to have three issues in the can. Like, I, I don't know. I think you would. Uh, I don't know. And then also, well, you have to capitalize on certain things. And when Stray Dogs did really well, you know, Tony had some ideas for these, these additional books, oversized books. And we, uh, we just got onto those real fast and finished them, the, uh, the Dog Days books. So, uh, right. yeah. That was such so, a lovely series. And it was so much fun, um, you know, little community of, of comic book nerds that that I'm part of and that I'm happy to always like, we're always sharing great info with each other. I remember when the news came out about those covers that you guys were doing that were an homage to so many great classic horror movies. I shared them and people just lost their, you know, the, where can I get these? You know, uh, how do I get yeah. my hands on one? It was, it was such a fun thing. It's, 
it's got to be great when you can recognize that a project is caught on in that way and you can have that much fun with it. Like you put in some work and you're like, whoa, 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 wait, we can have a good time for a minute. We can actually like, you know, do some fun, cool stuff. That's That's got to be an amazing feeling when it suddenly takes off because uh, like you said, so many of these things are going to get passed on. So many of them might be overlooked or underappreciated. And then suddenly you're like, wait, what happened? They like, what? And we're, 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 okay, what's happening? <laughs> How do I keep up with all of this? Well, I, I love books like that. Like, uh, uh, you know, where a guy like Tony who's been kicking around comics a long time has that kind of success. It, it really makes you happy. Uh, and it's, it's not like uh, just on name recognition, the team, that's not what's boosting the numbers that people really connect with it. And uh, I've never really been that into sales or really tracked it, probably because I'm an indie guy and it's, there's not gonna be anything <laughs> particularly impressive there, but I, I, it was, I gotta admit, I, I did get a little swept up. It was cool like to have that many people connect to something. I mean, I, I uh, I think I did two issues of Amazing Spider-Man and they did even sell like the uh, like the Stray Dogs issues did. So it's it's cool. It's cool that it's indie and that, it, you know, it's just uh, it's not based on name recognition or it's not like an A-list character. It's just uh, it's just a story that people connect with. So I love right. that. It, for me, it always reminds me of like a great recipe. You know, you've, you've suddenly tried something that you're like, I didn't know you could combine these things together, but oh, they taste so good. And now that you've had it, you just got to have more. Like, why, why would you deny yourself such a good yeah. thing? <laughs> and, and that, that's, uh, that was Trisha's first book too. So I'm like, oh man, don't get your hopes up on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always going to be this easy. Not always going to be this good. But uh, when it's good, hey, you know, enjoy it for all it's worth. I just started work on another book with Tony uh, this week. I just got the pages and I'm getting them ready to go. And I was like, well, you know, we're basically screwed on this one after the last one. So we <laughs> might as well just have fun with it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're always talking about the idea of what the sophomore, you know, concern might be when you're doing a second project with the same yeah. group or the same team or artist or something like that. Um, that's got to be, you know, one of those challenges. It's like, how do you do it even bigger, better, more than the last time? Especially if you get success, everyone goes, okay, so what's next? <laughs> yeah. like, I did the thing. I did that. Did do you remember that? Can, no, no resting on the laurel. Huh? And <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's one of the blessings of freelancing. I think you can never get too comfortable. You know, you're, you're never hitting that, that thing where you're like, wow, yeah. As I've, as I've joked with people, are like, wow, you kind of work a lot. I'm like, I've never been in that situation where I have too much money. I, I don't know. Maybe you have, but <laughs> it's, it's never happened yet. So there's that, that constant reminder of like, yeah, this isn't too much. Okay, let's get back to it. Let's yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, the financial end of freelancing. Yeah, that's a whole other podcast. That's, uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I'm thinking if I did a show like that, I would have to find a way to keep the balance. Because like you said, you and as I've said on so many occasions with folks, you have to laugh and you cry. There's so many situations where you're like, this could be a bit disheartening unless you can find the joy. I mean, there is one reminder for me for every moment that I'm working on something. And I recently saw someone put this as well. It, it's a gift. You know, the fact that you can keep working at the thing you're doing, you know, I'm well aware of the moments in my life where I thought it was impossible. So I took some job and it was a teaching job or a similar job. Sometimes it even was lucky enough to have some writing involved, but I knew I, I, I wasn't gonna do this forever. This was simply me biding time and finding the chance to, to work at the thing you love. I mean, I wouldn't trade it for anything else. I, yeah. I would never give it up. But if you're doing a podcast about what that challenge is like, there, there's going to be some hard moments too, you know, and being aware of that, keeping in mind that that too is part of the gift doesn't always feel like it, you know, yeah. but <laughs> it is, uh, it, it yeah. absolutely is. I mean, and I, you know, worst case scenario, you know, I'm coloring comic books in my pajamas all day, you know, it's not the end of the world. And, uh, and it, it's, a lot of really talented people are trusting their art with you. It's incredibly flattering. It's, uh, 
Yeah, you, it really, yeah, it, that, that is really where you can steer it to the positivity, even when the, the bad days, the quote unquote ditch digging days of uh, freelance. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 as you mentioned earlier with the idea of relationships in comics, it reminds me of my relationship with my art, with my craft, but also relationships in my life. I, I love my wife. But when we're fighting, I'm like, okay, this is this is part of the gift too, man. Like, you know, you, you, it's not always going to be perfect. You're, you're going to have disagreements. That's that's part of how two people find compromise and, and learn to work with each other and, you know, put something bigger in front of whatever the thing is you're fighting about. But it's it's a difficult thing in those moments. Like, okay, can we just get back to the happy stuff again? Because the happy stuff really fun and these moments are, are not as happy and and so often in relationships it's like that in relationships with your craft sure. it's like that it's it's a reminder of if you know why you're doing this it's worth it the, yeah. the hard parts the sad moments the frustrations they're worth it as long as you know why you're doing this and that's always important to you sure and i've been married for 22 years and uh couples that don't fight are just creepy there's something not right yeah, I don't know what ha happens when I'm not around and I don't want to know, but yeah, there's there's clearly. <laughs> well, with that in mind, I, I'd love to go ahead and just consider, you know, I've talked about the, the things that you've done up to this point in a number of ways and in about different projects. And it would be easy to make this like a three hour podcast where I go through each book and go, okay, let's talk about this one. Okay. Let's talk yeah. about this one. And that would be lovely. And I'm sure you have all the time in the world because freelancers, they get paid on their off hours. You know, when you're not exactly. drawing, <laughs> you're getting paid right now to do this with me. Yeah. Folks, he's not getting paid. I am not paying him. I'm not getting paid. I, I'm well aware of that too. Uh, you know, I've got work that I'm well aware of like, Hey, this is something I've got to do, but I do want to consider the fact that while we've talked about what you've done now, that's that's just to now you're a freelancer you're as you pointed out you just got pages and you're going to be working on a new project what do you think about when you see the future for you uh, as a colorist knowing that you've really enjoyed this path on independent comics this this great opportunity that you when you're looking at it do you see I guess the best question to keep it really open is, what do you see looking at, at independent comics, the future and what you're doing in them? You know, does it, does it surprise you? Because it's, you know, for me, I'm, I'm amazed at how much more independent comics I feel there are now than there were at different times, but that's my insight. I'm not inside the industry, you know, you are to a greater degree and, and what you can see about it. What would you love to share about? what you see as your future, the future of indie comics, but simply looking ahead because we've spent so much time looking back. Well, I, I feel um, that's one of irony of the way that my career's worked out. I feel very secure because I think the, the work is based on some very um, honest relationships. So uh, I would like to continue to work with the talented generous people that I work with. And I mean, it's, it's gotten only better. Um, they're, it, the working environment, I, it doesn't feel hostile to me. It feels welcoming, feels generous. Uh, a lot of artists are, you know, sharing percentages of ownership and, and things like that and doing things to accommodate the colorist even more, really respecting the craft. So, uh, I think it's only going to get better. And uh, I, I think just the enjoyment of these teams, I want to just do more with my friends, which uh, that's, that's always, you're always going to do it better next time. <laughs> so that's the one thing. That is thing. a mantra of mine. <laughs> yeah. So it, when we finish something, you know, it's always that, yeah, but the next one we do, that's that uh, we're really going to dial it in even better. So uh, yeah, I, I think that that's, uh, it's probably some good fortune that that my career has worked out that that it has, you know, with uh, building these these pitches and then creating projects from them with uh, with some good people. So that's that's what I hope continues. Ah, that's amazing. I mean, and I think you've 
earned all the security that you're experiencing right now. I think, you know, it's, it's proof of the investment, you know, if you, you're going to put in the work and at some point, you know, you're going to, you know, continue to develop these relationships. You're going to maintain these relationships. You're going to um, do your part, which is to you know, meet your deadlines and sort of be like, Hey, I'm always here. I'm ready for work. And through that, it's, it's like, the more you've invested, you're now seeing that that reward to a degree, that idea of like, look, as you said, you've got at least those 30 people, maybe more. I'm not asking you to list all your friends right now or relationships, <laughs> but you know, if you've got that 30 plus and you can say, OK, I've got that 30 plus that that gives me, you know, yeah. this this breadth to cover that I can. Yeah, well, in, in any aspiring artist or writers or anything listening to, it's just. I guess the only thing I would add to it is the, the failures become a lot less devastating because they, they are very frequent. You know, I, I respect people's privacy, so I never want to post about the jobs I don't get. But believe me, I try out for all kinds of books and I don't get them. And there are certain companies that don't like my work and certain editors, and it's fine. Uh, you just, as you go forward in this process, you become so accustomed to failure and pitches not getting picked up. And, you know, it just, you become pretty immune to it. You know, it's just, uh, so I, I never want to give the impression that failure is not a part of the lifestyle. It certainly is. So. I think that's an important reminder. I mean, you, it's always great to hear a champion in like sports or something who's like, yeah, I made that game winning shot. Let's talk about all the ones I missed. Go back to this title game when I missed or this big important game, you know, or something like that. It's like, the point is I took the shot, you know, and I kept taking the shot because that's the only way you A, get better and B, have any opportunity of getting the ball in. Because if you don't take the shot, guess what? Nothing happens. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not pitching, if you're not working, if you're not trying, nothing's going to happen. No one's going to walk into your bedroom and say, hey, I know you've been in your pajamas under the covers, eating cereal, watching cartoons, but you, we have work for you. Let's go. <laughs> they yeah, don't know well, who I, you are until you tell them who you are. <laughs> I could tell you as a creative person too, it's like putting yourself out there. It's painful. Like uh, artists are sensitive people, you know, and it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's okay to feel nervous and, and, and have the anxiety that, that, that surrounds that, you know, but you, you do have to push yourself out there. I mean, I can't stand it. I do it. <laughs> <laughs> I completely agree. I'm always reminded when it's a rough one of uh, there's the writer Anne Lamott. She wrote Bird by Bird, this book on on writing. And she she describes how, you know, she she has a son named Sam and she goes, whenever I get a rejection, letter, it's like someone called Sam ugly. It's like you just called my baby ugly. You know, how did how can you call a baby ugly? It's my baby. <laughs> but you know, it's it's also like dating. It's it's like, yeah, you you simply have to take the risk and there will be discomfort. There will be striking out. But hey, there's there's also successes. There's also great relationships. Sometimes yeah, you don't definitely. end up dating that person longer, but you have a great friendship with them. And that friendship can be, you know, so beneficial to your life. It's it's taking the risk, you know, and, yeah. and knowing that that's part of the gamble <laughs> and that even the great ones, you know, I, I love it when someone who's really established takes a big project and they're like, wow, they totally fell flat on their face. Like they've been so great at so many great things. How is it? Well, hey, you know, they, they continue to take the risk. That's that's part of yeah. the game. <laughs> it really is. Um, I'm always amazed, Brad, when I'm, I'm thinking about questions or I uncover ones about the possibility that for all the things I think I know going into a conversation, there's everything I'm well aware I'm going to miss simply because I'm a human being, my perception is limited. Um, this is our first time ever talking face to face, having a conversation like this. So I love to consider the possibility of the question not asked. That you're like, man, whenever they ask me this question, I have an answer like you would not believe. Or, you know, they never ask colorists this. They never ask, you know, and I love that idea because if I 
present that question and you've already got the answer. Someone out there could be going, I never even thought of that question before, but now I can and I've got an answer that goes along with it. So is there ever a question that you're like, one day they're gonna ask me and I have the answer and <laughs> it will shed all the light on color or all the light on this, this one thing. No problem, mind you. But I'm always curious, you know, if you're like, you know, yeah, it was great, but they never asked about this. They never asked me that. And um, uh, I love to present it. No, I mean, you know, I, I tell you, uh, I, I think it's been a really good conversation. We've gotten into a lot, you know, and you know what I like about it is that we could talk about just some of the, the funny stories, some of the predicaments and things that go along uh, with this business and then you can go back and laugh so I mean uh, for me that stuff usually doesn't get uncovered it's like people are see you as some kind of established pro or whatever and they and you're going to share your expertise but I love that we got to go back to those stories where I was up at four in the morning completely <laughs> screwing up a page that I had no business coloring in the first place <laughs> it's it's I think it's a lot of fun. I mean, because yeah. one, you, you can laugh at it now with a, with a certain degree of distance. You can sort of look back and go, hey, remember that? You know, when, when, if I got you that same morning and it was like, hey, Brad, what happened last night? And you're like, oh, God, I don't, I can't, <laughs> I don't know if I can articulate right now. I feel like. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, this was a lot of fun for me just to explore uh have an opportunity to get some insights because also the great thing for me now too is that i know these books i know that when i go back to read them again that when i'm enjoying the colors i'm going to be thinking about everything we just talked about it's oh great it, yeah that's that's so much fun for me it's 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 the great part of, of hearing or being a part of any interview is that if you already know about something as i said i have my perception but now it's been enhanced because of everything you just told me, all the things I can consider now. And I, I hope for everyone listening, that's something they can enjoy as well. You've got such an amazing laundry list of books that you've worked on and you know, such great opportunities for someone to go in and go, hey, I remember when he said this and I can see it right there on the page. And now so much more about that story is something I can make a part of what I enjoy and why I enjoy it. And oh, that's uh, great. My pleasure, man. I think it's I think it's another gift. Uh, yeah. If I can be part of any way of translating that gift, um, well, I'm really lucky, you know. Yeah. It's, well, uh, I, I tell you, I've had it. It's this has been really fun for me. So uh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious. Do you still live in the Bay Area? Are you still located? I live in San uh, Francisco. No, I live in Ashland, Oregon. So okay. uh, you know, the Bay is. Uh, it's it's great. I, I I used to live in uh, Rock Ridge area oh, wow, of Oakland. Yeah. It was nice, a, a great walkability, a good neighborhood. It's just uh, getting older and having kids and stuff is pricey. <laughs> you're you're preaching to the choir. A couple of years back, we uh, we were living in Oakland until uh, 2019. Um, I lived over uh, right over by the Whole Foods, um, right over there off Bay Place. Oh, okay. um, off Harrison. Yeah, there's a nickname for it. And now it's totally escaping me. I'm like, that's my old neighborhood. And I can't even think of what the, the neighborhoods referred to. But um, it, it became a price issue. And then we ended up moving to San Leandro because my mother in law recently started forgetting things. And we were like, hey, we're going to get a bigger place where all of us can share. So that's the fun for me, yeah. too, is I'm fully aware of the fact that sometimes for these podcasts, I find the room that's the furthest away from everybody that I can close off create this fake background behind me and be like, hey, I got a chance to carve out this moment to have a conversation because when you're freelancing, yeah, it's the hustle. You know, you're you're building it out of imagination. <laughs> well, I, I, I told you Friday initially, you know, we talked about doing this. And then like the moment I sent the email, I was like, what am I thinking? Both my kids will be home on Friday. It'll be chaos. Let's uh or that would probably be a real accurate depiction of my life. This is <laughs> this, this is, is like the social media glam version <laughs> right this feels like this is definitely something that i tried to create that should be sterile or of some kind but yeah i picked the one day of the week when my wife usually goes to work really early and my mother-in-law is off doing something nope she's got a friend visiting who's staying with us what i didn't find out till about three days ago and it turns out my wife wasn't going into work until like 11 today and i'm like 
okay, guys, I'm trying to do stuff based on what we know. And you changed everything the one day I needed you to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like that's, yeah. <laughs> you got to you gotta strap in sometimes. Yeah, it's going to be. <laughs> it's a Hard. juggling act. I feel like yeah. it's such a reminder of freelancing. You know, this idea of like, look, you know, there's what you want to happen. And then there's how you figure out how to get something done, no matter what's happening. And oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's a, the, the, the kids are always going to be homesick on a deadline day. Or it's, oh, yeah. It, Murphy's law. Like it's just, yeah. it's got to go all the, you need, you need the stimulus. You need the catalyst to get it done. So <laughs> sure, just the juices going. Hey, Brad, look, I, I'm well aware of the fact that people might get enough from just rewatching this video, um, this conversation, listening to the audio part, whatever they're doing. But there's a chance they might want to get more updated information, keep up with you on a regular basis, um, see what else you're working on when announcements are made, uh, do things like that. It, are there favorite places where you frequent on social media where you communicate most often where you're like, hey, this is where you'll most likely see me updating or where yeah. I might exchange with you? Anything like that you'd like to share? Yeah, uh, I'm on uh, Twitter, 20 Eyes Brad on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, I, I, Twitter, I keep it all work stuff. Um, Instagram, you'll have to suffer through some pictures of my kids, stuff like that, uh, like soccer games and and all that. But um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's pretty There's much good it. places to find you. Yeah, that's our yeah. Hey, my I have an Instagram page, and it's part writing and also part my dogs because they're just a part of everything I do. Sometimes I'll do my own podcast where I'm recording somewhere else and the dog will either whine to get in or he'll be at my feet snoring. And I'll sort of chuckle like, hi, everyone. There's a soundtrack today. That's my yeah. snoring dog. And that's just, hi. <laughs> Here yep. we are. <laughs> hey, they, they want to look behind the curtain. There it is. Yeah. Right. It's not all <laughs> glamour. It's not, you know, not all sunshine. <laughs> yeah. Um, Brad, I can't thank you enough. I love ah, walking my pleasure. away from a conversation with a laugh and a smile. And I, I love knowing that, as I said, just from chatting with you, everything that I'll get to enjoy about your books is now even more informed than it was before. And for everyone oh, else listening, my pleasure. Uh, I, I hope that they have that same experience too. I, I, I kind of know they will. Actually, <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Yeah, this was a really fun chat. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Hope to see you around sometime. Maybe if I ever make it out of my work dungeon to a con or something, we'll we'll get some actual FaceTime. I'd let, I would really enjoy that. I'm gonna hit the stop on record so we can stop being public in okay. front of others and just finish <laughs> up our conversation. You know, as two people just talking. So thank you to everyone listening, and um, I highly encourage. Brad just told you the places to find him, and I think you're gonna enjoy what you see when you go to check him out. Thanks, Brad. <laughs> Thank you.